This week we will be looking at the anatomy of the spleen. Alright, so in previous weeks we have been looking at the anatomy of the abdomen. That is the stuff between the diaphragm and the stuff in the pelvis and it's kind of got peritoneum around it and stuff like that. So we looked at the small intestine, the large intestine, the liver and blah, blah, blah. And when we look at the pancreas, we saw in the nestling, well, the tail of the pancreas nestles in the spleen. What do you guys know about the spleen? What would you like to know about the spleen? If you don't know what you don't know about the spleen, then you don't know what you... From an anatomist's perspective then, we should have a look at where the spleen is. Can you see the spleen? Uh, the spleen's there, can you see it? Where is the spleen? What other structures in the abdomen are next to the spleen? Because if we know that, then we have a better understanding of our anatomy. But also, if you were to look at an X-ray or a transverse MR or CT scan, or even a coronal MR or CT scan, you can work out where the spleen is in relation to the other organs and, and, and not confuse the spleen with the kidney. You wouldn't do that, would you? And then we could talk about the structure of the um, spleen itself. Have you been enjoying the recent histologies? Just a little bit, but as I always say, anatomy is the whole thing. It's from the cells up to the gross stuff that you can see. The only thing that's limiting you from looking at the cells is the artificial limitation of your eyes. We need to understand the ultra, the, the, the little tiny ultra structure anatomy to be able to understand the gross anatomy and how it all works, right? If you can't have one without the other, we can, but it's less fun, it doesn't make as much sense. So we'll have a little look at the structure of the spleen and that will help us explain its function. And then once we understand its structure and its function, we can think about what goes wrong with the spleen, can't we? And um, of course, one thing you might know about the spleen is that people have their spleens removed. That's a splenectomy. Why would you have your spleen removed? Can you live without your spleen? I guess you can live without your spleen if people have their spleens removed. But if you have your spleen removed, does then that have an effect? Is that a problem? Is a, you know, short answer, yes. Long answer, we'll find out later. So I don't know if you are new to these videos or if you've seen them before, if you've watched this video 10 times already. Now this instruction seems a bit weird to you, but um, <laughs> people watch these videos a lot for exams and stuff. But um, I've been recording these videos for about a year now. This is the Christmas break. Um, there is nobody around. I have all of the labs to myself. There's nobody else here. Not, the lights for the lab were even off. Um, I think the third years or the fourth years, third years probably, have exams after Christmas. I know they're kicking around, but they're more interested in clinical method stuff because they know their anatomy. Don't they? Yeah. Um, but um, I've been uploading, so my aim was, I'm a teaching lecturer and um, I like teaching. I like anatomy, so that kind of works. I also like making things. So I some, for some reason, I wasn't bored, I, I had plenty to do, um, but I thought I would um, set myself a challenge of creating an anatomy video every week for as long as I could really, but for, in the first instance for at least a year. So I've completed that, well done me. Um, so I, I try to make a video every week and upload every week on an anatomical topic and usually it's whatever I've been teaching that week because I've already prepared something, it's fresh in my head, I've found hopefully an interesting and engaging way of teaching it. The way I would teach it to a small group of students is going to be different to the way I present it to you because you are a camera and you don't respond to what I say, well not quickly, you can do in the comments but then it's kind of slow isn't it. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, I've noticed actually that as the number of subscribers has been increasing recently, that's quite motivational, that, qu that seems quite nice, that seems like people are actually finding this useful and listening to what I do, so maybe I should keep doing it and making more of them. So if you, know, if you haven't subscribed and this waffling hasn't put you off, then maybe do a subscribe or a like or something. To be honest, it's not something I ask for, um, this is kind of just an extra thing that I do for some reason. You know what, I think one of the reasons for doing this for recording this sort of thing is um, as an anatomist we're very aware of our own mortality right we work with bodies that people have kindly donated to us to examine for our own study and for students to study so we can better understand human anatomy and we can train people who need to understand human anatomy so they can use it clinically and look after people and stuff so you do you become very aware that you are this soft squishy thing that could be gone at any time one other thing, 
me, me, me talking to you is not a substitute for you getting in the lab, right? If you're a student of anatomy, then hopefully you have access to a lab, maybe to cadavers, maybe to models, or at least to skeletons. You, you don't study anatomy by people talking to you. What I do in these videos is I choose what to talk about. I pick things out. I'm not going to tell you everything because you'll be swamped and you'll be asleep in no time. I'm going to pick things out that I think are useful and important. I'm trying to get everybody up. You know, some, some, some videos will be more detailed and some videos will be less detailed and some people will be more general. But for you to study anatomy, for you to really understand this, you need to study it. You need to spend time reading the textbooks, looking at the models, studying anatomy. That's how you learn it. You don't learn it from people in videos talking to you. All right? I ain't that good. Okay, have you found the spleen yet? Yeah, you can see it. There it is. That's it there. Whoop. So look, it's, 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 it's lateral, right? It's on the left side. Right, so if you've got your mid-axillary line, the middle of your axilla, there's a line that goes down here. It's a little bit posterior, right? So it's not quite in the middle. It's a little bit, it's kind of lateral, but a little bit posterior of lateral, if that makes sense. And count the ribs. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 is a little diddy guy in the muscle back there. So look, there it is, nine, 10, oh, nine, 10, 11. So the spleen is at about the ribs, at uh, the level of ribs nine, 10, and 11. Hey, do you know you can find your 11th rib, right? So you've got your, you've got your, your costal cartilage, right? And you've got your costal margin. Ooh, if you follow it round, oh, why are you trying to cut that very sensitive pokey things, right? Oh. That is the anterior end of your 11th rib, because the 11th rib is a floating rib like. Uh, this is what I'm talking about here, there you go, see? Let's take these lungs out, take the liver out. You can see the diaphragm, right? Here's the diaphragm around here. Now, if I take the stomach out, now you can see the spleen more clearly. So the stomach is anterior to the spleen. And here we see the pancreas, so the pancreas is retroperitoneal, so it's behind the peritoneum, and the tail of the pancreas is going up into the hilum of the spleen, and the blood vessels to the spleen are following the pancreas up into the hilum there. And those, that's the splenic artery and the splenic vein that are supplying blood to the spleen, and they supply, well, the splenic artery is supplying blood to the spleen, and it's supplying blood to the pancreas as it goes along, and then the splenic vein is draining blood from the pancreas, and the splenic vein will then meet the inferior mesenteric vein, uh, and then the splenic vein and the inferior mesenteric vein will continue, and then meet with the superior mesenteric vein, and then they become the portal vein, and they go to the liver over there. So the spleen drains its blood to the liver, like a gastrointestinal organ does, but it's not a gastrointestinal organ. It is a secondary lymphoid organ. Um, see here? Uh, this is the large bowel, so this is the transverse colon, it's changing direction here, yeah? So it's, so that is the uh, left colic flexure, also gets called the splenic flexure because it's next to the spleen. So the large intestine, look, is kind of at the inferior pole here. And you can see the diaphragm is, is posterior to the spleen um, and lateral to the spleen. Ribs 9, 10 and 11 are lateral to the spleen here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, because of course, remember, they're going up a bit, right? Angling up and around. Take that out. You can see that there's the kidney. So the, the superior pole of the kidney is nestling up into the spleen. The kidney is posterior. The left kidney and the right kidney. The spleen is lateral. And it's more anterior than the left kidney. Don't mix them up, they do look similar. Um, and also look, the spleen is more superior than the kidney. So you can imagine if you've got a section where you've just got a bit of spleen, you might think it's a kidney, but it's, it's not you know, a transverse section. Um, here's the esophagus coming in here, there's the adrenal gland, the abdominal aorta is, is here, there's the inferior vena cava. The kidneys are retroperitoneal, so they're posterior to the peritoneum. If you still haven't got the hang of peritoneum, peritoneal cavity, mesenteries yet, 
go and look at my cling film and peritoneum video and see if that helps. But um, we've talked about the embryology. So embryologically, the stomach starts off as a simple tube, right? So in the embryo, there's this abdomen, abdominopelvic, or this, there's a cavity right in the, in the embryo, and the, the, the early gut tube runs through that cavity and is held onto the posterior abdominal wall by, by two layers of meat, by two layers of peritoneum, this serous membrane. The two layers come together and surround the, uh, the early tube, and where they come together, that forms the mesentery, where it covers the tube, that's visceral peritoneum, where it lines the abdominal cavity, that's parietal peritoneum, right? Now, at the level of the stomach, we call, we actually, well, we find um, a posterior mesentery in the embryo, so we call that the the dorsal mesogastrium. We like to use words dorsal and ventral when we're talking about embryos because they're kind of curved and folded and stuff. Um, meso, so mesentery, gastrium, gaster, meaning, you know, referring to the stomach in this case. But there's also a ventral mesogastrium. So there's a sheet of, of, of that, that, that mesogastrium between the stomach and the, and the anterior abdominal wall, just at the level of the stomach. And then we saw that the, the liver develops in that ventral mesogastrium, so does part of the pancreas, so does the gallbladder. But in this dorsal mesogastrium, another bit of the pancreas forms, but that's where we also find the spleen forming within those two sheets, those two layers of dorsal mesogastrium between the abdominal wall and the stomach. Now the stuff that forms or lines the tube of the GI tract comes from endoderm, the endoderm layer of the three germ layers of the embryo, right? So the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder, they're all buds of endoderm from the GI tract, they form from that. The spleen, although it's in the abdomen, although it's in the mesentery, it does not form from the endoderm. It forms from the, uh, the mesenchyme, the mesoderm layer that everything else forms from, okay? But this means that in the adult then, we, um, we have um, the liver is attached to the anterior abdominal wall by the falciform ligament, that's part of the ventral mesentery. And then the liver is attached to the stomach by the lesser omentum, that's part of the ventral mesogastrium. But then the stomach has this, this um, greater omentum hanging down from it, which kind of grows from the greater omentum then back and attaches to the top of the transverse colon, but that, that then goes back, the, the, the stomach is attached to the spleen by the gastrosplenic ligament, it's not really a ligament, but you know, it's connected tissue, see, they get called ligaments. The gastrosplenic ligament then joins the stomach and the spleen, and then, <clears throat> because that's part of the dorsal mesogastrium, and then the spleen is attached to the posterior abdominal wall, kind of around the area of the left kidney by the lienorenal ligament. Sorry, I didn't name it. Lieno, uh, Latin for spleen. So the, the, the mesentery between the spleen and the left kidney, kidney renal, gets called the lienorenal ligament. Why didn't they call it the uh, splenorenal ligament? Maybe it does also get called the splenorenal ligament. To be fair, the ligament or the, the sheet of mesentery between the spleen and the stomach does get called the gastrolienal ligament. See, anatomy, you don't just learn one word for a structure, you learn two or more. <laughs> You've got to spend time on this stuff. Um, and then it becomes language and it becomes easy and you just remember it and it's fine. So that means that if the spleen is held in place by those sheets of mesentery, the spleen is a little bit mobile. And that does make sense really because of course it's under the diaphragm. <sighs> diaphragm moves, everything else has to move a little bit as well. Okay, so that's where the spleen is, that's its blood supply, those are the organs nearby, those are the connective tissues holding it in place. In terms of nervous innervation, it has autonomic nervous innervation. Have you got this idea of, um, um, so everything around here, all the parasympathetic innervation comes from the vagus nerve and all the sympathetic innervation is coming from the sympathetic trunk. Now we find around these anterior branches from the abdominal aorta, uh, say around the celiac trunk here, we find a celiac ganglion and a celiac plexus. So the ganglion 
is a collection of cell bodies where we have pre-ganglionic sympathetic neurons meeting post-ganglionic sympathetic neurons and whoop. Um, and the plexus is just where these nerve fibers or these autonomic nerve fibers are like crossing over. So we find this celiac plexus around here and then sympathetic nerves and probably parasympathetic nerves to think about as well, but certainly sympathetic nerves love to follow arteries to their destination. So we find autonomic nerves around the celiac trunk, so the, the fibres of the celiac plexus, then follow the celiac trunk and its branches, in this case the, uh, the splenic artery, out to the artery. So they, that was a really long-winded way of saying that the spleen is innervated by autonomic nerves and the function of those autonomic nerves is vasomotor, you know, so sympathetic innervation causes vasoconstriction, as we see elsewhere in the body. Still, it's pretty cool though. So I said that the spleen is a secondary lymphoid organ, so we're, we're thinking about the immune system here. What are the primary lymphoid organs? Um, bone marrow is the main one, and also the thymus, which is not there. Thymus is up here. Thymus is up here somewhere, it's more prominent in children. So um, the bone marrow is the site of, major site of hematopoiesis in adults, right? The formation of new blood cells. So erythrocytes, red blood cells, and uh, lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, that sort of thing. But of course, T cells are so named because precursor cells from the bone marrow move to the thymus, mature in the thymus, and then they become T lymphocytes. If an organ is producing or significantly maturing um, lymphocytes, then it's um, a primary lymphoid organ, so bone marrow and thymus. Secondary lymphoid organs are stores of uh, lymphoid cells, of lymphocytes. So then that tells us that the spleen is a site where um, lymphocytes are stored. And yes, we see T cells and B cells in here and macrophages and all sorts. Um, but it's also a place where we see a lot of erythrocytes and platelets. In the fetus, the spleen is also a site of hematopoiesis. So in, in, the, in the fetus, the spleen is making new blood cells, as is the liver in the, uh, in the fetus. But after birth, in humans at least, it stops. Um, I think in most mammals it doesn't do hematopoiesis after birth, but in other vertebrates it, 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 it might do. I don't think it does in mammals. Anyway, so in the fetus, hematopoiesis, um, but after birth, it doesn't make red blood cells anymore. Oh, thinking about um, development, you might find an accessory spleen. I think maybe like 10% of people might have a little bit of accessory splenic tissue. You can imagine it's gonna be in that, that dorsal mesogastrium somewhere, right? It's only gonna be diddy, maybe a centimeter or two in diameter. <sighs> Useless fact of the day. Anyway, um, so if we look Inside the spleen, we see red pulp and white pulp. So if we take a gross spleen, like a, a living spleen, and we cut it in half and open it up, we'll, we'll see red areas and white areas. Um, and now the spleen is covered by a thinnish connective tissue capsule, and that capsule extends into the spleen to give it some structure and, and shape. And as it extends in, those are trabeculae, that takes blood vessels into the spleen. Um, and then we see um, those, so those blood vessels, around those blood vessels we see white pulp, and in the white pulp, that's where we see our, find our B cells and our T cells. And then outside of the white pulp, pretty much everything else in the spleen is red pulp, because it looks red. And the reason it looks red is because it's full of erythrocytes. So the spleen is a store of red blood cells, and it's also a store of platelets, which makes it very useful in trauma and blood loss, right? Because if you have um, bleeding, then you can release a whole bunch of platelets and help stem that loss of blood. You, you know, form some clots, and then you've got uh, red blood cells to replace those that are lost. The, um, so it's kind of a, yeah, I mean, that's one of its functions. The immune system side then, in the white pulp, um, this is a site of opsonization is not a word that anatomists use very often. It's, a, it's an immunologist's word. Um, it's, um, um, so bacteria and foreign things and pathogens and bits um, get presented in the spleen and then get tagged for destruction. That's opsonization, or at least that's an anatomist's description of opsonization. So it's, um, it's a site where um, stuff that needs to be destroyed gets targeted for destruction, so is that part of the, uh, the immune response. It's also a site 
where antibodies can be produced, so it's a site where the body can mount an immune response. So that's the, the white pulp. Now the red pulp has also got another funky function. Um, the body's constantly producing erythrocytes, red blood cells, and they don't hang around forever. They've got kind of got a use-by date. And in the spleen, you've got arter arteries coming in, and then that arter arterial blood goes into like sinusoids. And those sinusoids are lined with endothelial cells like other blood vessels, but they've got an intra inter inter endothelial slit. And what happens is that um, a red blood cells, if you're a nice, happy, young, flexible red blood cell of about the right size and everything's good, you'll just slip through that slit. You're just going to squeeze a little bit and you'll go through that intraendothelial slit and you'll get into the red pulp and you'll float around and you'll disappear off and you're cool, right? But if you are an erythrocyte that's, that's enlarged for some reason, maybe for some pathological process, or maybe you're just getting old and everything's breaking down, or if you've got a bit stiff and you're not really flexible and you can't really get through it anymore and maybe you break up a little bit, um, um, so if you're a weird shape or you're not, you're not very deformable or you're, for, you're a bit large, you're an erythrocyte that probably, you know, we could do with recycling you and making some more. So those get sequestered by the, the spleen and then they get sent. Do you remember how we got the, um, the splenic vein goes eventually to the portal vein and goes to the liver? Well, those erythrocytes that have been pulled aside and need to be recycled then get sent to the liver where they get recycled, right? Some of the useful bits we keep, the rest of it we throw away. Hemoglobin, bilirubin, jaundice, makes your feces brown, that sort of stuff, yeah? Um, so that's the other function of, of the spleen, is to filter out old erythrocytes um, and keep the new ones. So this means that um, if there is a pathogenic process or pathological process that is changing red blood cells, so thalassemia, or malaria, or hereditary spherocytosis, where the red blood cells become round, then that disease processes, process changes the red blood cells, and then those red blood cells might get picked out as, in the spleen as needing to be removed. So then you start removing too many red blood, cell, red blood cells, and then you get anemia. Sometimes removing the spleen is the solution, for not, but not for all, just, when we cut sections of a spleen and stain it for histology, then of course we change the colours of the cells. We use, um, say, hematoxyl and eosin to stain the cells so that we can see them. So this changes the colours. So if we look at the histology, we can see a central um, blood vessel there. And surrounding that is, is, uh, is white pulp. But of course it looks kind of blue there because you've got a nuclei stained and what have you. And you're talking about, ah, so given what we know about the spleen, what can go wrong? And because of where it sits under the rib cage, you can't normally palpate it, but it can become enlarged with liver disease, um, cancers of the blood or infection and that sort of thing. The, the spleen might become enlarged. And if a patient breathes in and flattens their diaphragm, you may be able to palpate the spleen under the, spleen under the costal cartilage. If it enlarges, it's going to enlarge across the diaphragm in, in this direction. Um, because of course blood cancers um, like leukemia and that sort of thing are going <clears> to... <throat> um, in terms of trauma, so the ribs, the, the, the spleen is under the ribs, so the ribs protect the spleen. However, of course, if you have a blow sufficient to fracture a rib, then the, the spleen is at risk of damaging from being damaged by the rib itself. Um, in fact, just a blow to the side of, the, of, the, of this region here can be enough to cause the spleen to rupture because it's just got that little thin capsule over the top of it. And if it ruptures and it sees an awful lot of blood, then um, you may come across a bleeding internally. So if somebody is losing blood into their abdominal cavity. I mean, the signs of this are, if you think about it, uh, dizziness, uh, increased heart rate to cope with the lowered blood pressure, and if you can measure it, a lowered blood pressure. So watch out for that. A ruptured spleen is a medical emergency. That person needs to go to the hospital now. Um, and hopefully the spleen can be repaired, and, but it, it can be difficult because of this capsule and what have you. If possible, the spleen can be repaired and the, and the blood um, loss stopped. It's not like a first choice these days to just get rid of the spleen, um, you know, as like the first option. 
But if you can't stop the bleeding and the patient's losing a lot of blood in turn and there's a risk of them bleeding to death, then to remove the spleen, of course, you need to ligate the splenic um, artery and vein. But you kind of want to do this as close to the hilum as possible because there are blood vessels that pass to the stomach and blood vessels that pass to the pancreas from these arteries. So, you know, you don't want to cut those organs off from blood supply. And then you remove the spleen. Um, and um, you stop the bleeding. But of course, that person, person then doesn't have the benefits of um, a store of platelets and a store of red blood cells for possible future trauma. But the bigger problem is infection. That person is likely then to be taking low dose antibiotics for the rest of their life. They need to pay extra attention to signs of infection because it's gonna be harder for them to fight infection uh, and things like that. They won't be able to mount the same immune response as somebody with a spleen because this, that's what the spleen is good at doing, but they haven't got one, so they have to be more careful. So your spleen is important. Do take care of your spleen but you can remove it and live without it. And of course, the, um, the spleen is also more likely to rupture if enlarged. So if you've got an enlarged spleen, you should probably avoid contact sports and mountain biking and skiing and things like that um, for a bit. So there you go, hopefully you need to know everything about the spleen, what you need to know now. You know where it is, you know what other organs are nearby it. You know what it does. We've had a look at the cells. Um, uh, yeah, it's not that much to it really, is there? Okay, right, I'm going home. Um, see you next time.